All right, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, my name is Alana Rahmani and I'm a project manager at the Jewish Funders Network. And we are delighted to host today's conversation in partnership with the Israel Democracy Institute on the topic of Israel's new government, what to expect from Netanyahu's coalition with the ultra-Orthodox and religious right. The recent election in Israel saw the rise of the National Religious Party and the two ultra-Orthodox parties and the representatives are expected to hold key positions in the new cabinet. We are joined today by Yochanan Plesner, president of IDI, and Shlomit Ravitsky Torpaz, director of IDI's Joan and Erwin Jacobs Center for Shared Society, who will be in conversation with Dr. Jesse Ferris, vice president of strategy, as they analyze what led to this election result and what it may mean for Israel's future. So now I'd like to pass on the conversation to Dr. Ferris. Thank you. Thank you, Alana, and thank you to JFN for the, uh, uh, the auspices uh, for this important conversation. So we're uh, exactly one month out from Israel's uh, fifth election and uh, hopefully the end of a, uh, a very prolonged political crisis that uh, has afflicted Israel over the past four years. Um, now, when we originally scheduled this, we were gonna speak about Israel's new government. We had hoped that there'd be a new government in place, but of course in Israel, nothing is so simple. So the coalition negotiations are still ongoing and maybe we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, we'll, we'll spend most of the discussion talking about the policy implications of the, the likely uh, new government, but uh, I wanted to begin by um, uh, focusing on the elections themselves, the results, and uh, getting a bit of an understanding of what happened there. I, I'm sure most of our listeners have, have read up on the subject, but still we, we have a couple of uh, seasoned experts, the, and I'd like to ask you first, Yohanan, um, at the end of the day, only 30,000 votes separated the pro-Netanyahu block from the anti-Netanyahu block, if we want to simplify the, uh, the electoral map in that, in that faction. And yet somehow the Netanyahu or the pro-Netanyahu block wound up with a fairly solid majority of 64 seats out of 120 in the Knesset. Can you explain briefly why and how that, that came about? Well, so uh, good evening, or good evening from Jerusalem, and I guess in the U.S. it's around uh, lunchtime, and so he, uh, and it's great uh, uh, for the opportunity to uh, have this conversation. So thanks, Jesse, for your question. Yeah, well, uh, it's interesting. Two point three, or uh, as a matter of fact, two point uh, three hundred and thirty thousand Israelis. Uh, voted uh, uh, for the anti-Netanyahu bloc, and uh, 2.360,000 Israelis uh, voted for the Netanyahu bloc. So it's 49.5% uh, versus 48.9. Uh, uh, so about half a percent of a difference. Uh, but de facto, in terms of uh, a seat allocation in the Knesset, it uh, ended up as 64 versus 56, which is... Uh, 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 a very solid, very comfortable uh, majority, especially, and we'll, we'll talk about it later, given uh, the fact that uh, Israel, uh, uh, a democracy without a constitution, if you have a cohesive uh, and adamant uh, group of 64, you can uh, uh, change a, a lot, not, if not to say change the fundamentals of the uh, features, of, fundamental features of the Jewish state. How did we get there? Uh, well, the the simple answer is that the Netanyahu uh, camp uh, had optimal um, uh, political architecture. So no law, no vote left behind was the uh, the logic. Two ultra orthodox parties, uh, one the uh, Sephardi Shas party, uh, the Ashkenazi uh, ultra orthodox parties. Uh, there were some disputes and rifts, but. Uh, 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 the rabbis, alongside assistance from Mr. Netanyahu, <laughs> helped bring it all together and ensure that all of those parties increased uh, their uh, uh, support. Uh, although they uh, turned out in very high proportion, this time they e even managed to increase it by about 3% to 83% tur turnout versus about 80% in, in round number four. Uh, then there was the, the far-right party, the combination of the... Uh, Ben Gvir and, and Smotrich, uh, what they call Tzionut uh, Datit, uh, uh, religious Zionism, although it's a, a bit of a, a deviation of, of, of traditional re uh, religious Zionism. Uh, they ran together and, and therefore they didn't lose any votes and Likud. So the entire Netanyahu bloc is made up of, uh, of uh, merely uh, four parties and uh, 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 
and uh, those parties uh, also uh, enjoyed uh, an increase in uh, in voter turnout of around five uh, percent, say in in Likud strongholds. Uh, we have some nice uh, data where we see how the uh, participation in uh, in the southern cities that are characterized by uh, support for the Netanyahu bloc. There was a uh, uh, an increase, quite a significant increase in turnout, and also in a sort of mid-sized uh, towns like Ashdod, Ashkelon, and so on. So this uh, increase uh, in turnout uh, versus uh, uh, stagnation in turnout in, in the cities that characterize uh, uh, or that are characterized by support for center-left, where there was a pretty much stagnant support, uh, uh, places like uh, Erzeliya, Ra'anana, and so on. They vote in very high numbers, but it didn't increase, versus places like Be'er Sheva that increased uh, uh, by a few percentage points. So the combination of the fact higher turnout, <clears throat> no vote, and, and, and no uh, uh, wasted votes, and the center-left bloc, including the Arab parties, uh, uh, the turnout increased only in the uh, among the Arab parties, about 7% increase, which wasn't enough to offset uh, the, the rise in the uh, Likud uh, strongholds. And of course, the one big difference about, give or take, 300,000 votes that went uh, uh, down the drain uh, because the Meretz uh, Zionist left-wing party didn't cross the threshold, was around uh, just over 3%, and the Bal Balad party representing uh, uh, parts of the Arab minority was also around 3% and didn't cross the threshold of 3.25. So around 6% of votes, uh, a little more actually, uh, uh, went down the drain on one side, and that explains the uh, decisive outcome in terms of uh, 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 allocation of Knesset seats. And, uh, you know, for it ends, in this respect, it ends a four-year long political crisis without decisive outcomes. Now we have a decisive outcome. Um, uh, there are many future policy repercussions and we're gonna talk about them, uh, but at least we can say, although Israelis were called to vote five times in, four, in, in, in less than four years, they nevertheless showed up about 70% turnout. Uh, and, and if you actually calculate it out of the number of Israelis who are actually present in the country, it's around, 90% because about 10% of eligible voters live overseas. You meet some of them in New York, for example. Then it's actually closer to 80% turnout. So this is good news about our democracy. People show up, they demonstrate faith. There was no violence. There was <clears throat> there was a heightened verbal uh, rhetoric and, and a much uh, a divisive rhetoric, but no violence, high turnout, decisive outcome. So those are some of the good uh, aspects. And, and I, I would assume that in a moment you're going to ask about some of the uh, less uh, promising aspects. All right, that was a good uh, summary of the, of, of the results and, and, and how we got to where we are. So as I mentioned, we're still in the process of forming a government, but it, it, it's fairly clear that Benjamin Netanyahu, who heads the Likud party, um, will be the next uh, prime minister. And he's now uh, leading coalition negotiations that should be resolved in the next few weeks, unless uh, um, there are un unforeseen um, uh, developments. But um, Shlomi, turning to you, so I, I presume our, our viewers are familiar with Likud, uh, the largest party in the Knesset with 32 seats, which we should remind our viewers is slightly over a quarter of the seats in the Knesset. So it's a far cry from what Americans are used to in terms of a congressional or a ruling majority, but such is the nature of Israel's fragmented political system. But so this is the largest party with 32 seats. Um, uh, they need coalition partners in order to form a government. Um, and so in this new coalition government, the Likud will be heavily dependent on its partners. Can you tell us a little bit more about who these likely partners are and what they stand for? Um, okay, so uh, hello. Um, we have two ultra-Orthodox parties which are part of the government we're going to see soon. One is a Sephardic uh, party that is uh, getting a larger, it's with us for a long time now, but uh, it, get, it got larger in the last few years. Uh, we're aware that not all the voters of this party are actually ultra-Orthodox in their lifestyle. Many of them are what we call traditional, 
traditional people who would like to see the ultra-Orthodox uh, Sephardic representative as their people in the parliament. But it doesn't mean necessarily that that's the way they live. Many of them, as we see traditional people in Israel, might go to the synagogue in the morning of Shabbat, but after afterwards uh, might use the car and go to uh, to other things with their families, go to visit their parents and their kids. So those people are a large amount of people that did vote for uh, for Shas, for the Sephardic Orthodox Party, but are not necessarily, a, a, their identity is much more complex. Uh, and we see the other Orthodox Party, which is a, some kind of a partnership between the Hasidic um, ultra-Orthodox ultra -orthodox people and what we call uh, the Litvax, um, the other uh, ultra-Orthodox party, they, they, they are together in the same party and they are also a, a part of Israel um, government. Most of the years we see the ultra-Orthodox parties in the government only for two small periods of time uh, now and uh, uh, less than a decade ago but uh, they're not part of the government. So we see them there all the time, but it's not the same because they're usually a mi minority of the government. Now we see them as a very important and a, 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 and a, a part which is um, Netanyahu needs them uh, in a way he didn't need in the past. And the other two parties, um, which are also, they have some kind of a, a partnership between them. They ran together as one party, but they're actually two parties. So we see the modern Orthodox parties. Uh, how much are they modern and how much are they just Orthodox? It's a question. Um, but those are parties that uh, are very, um, the nationality, is very important for them. The Zionism is very important for them. The Orthodox, Orthodox uh, parties are not necessarily Zionist. They see um, the, the land of Israel, the people of Israel, of course, the Torah, or Israel Torah, as the important uh, uh, things for them, but not necessarily uh, the country of, of, uh, of Israel and the uh, coming back to Zion as a place, but not um, not necessarily as becoming a modern country. For the modern Orthodox people, this is the, the dream. They give to the country a lot of uh, spiritual and religious value. And the question of being here together with the Arab people um, would be a very main thing. What kind of uh, rights and benefits are we to give um, the Arab, the minorities here, and what is part of when Israel came back, the people of Israel came back to, to the country, we should be, uh, we should see here uh, something that is different, uh, we should be uh, ruling here uh, in an absolute way. So those are some of the questions we see uh, among the people uh, uh, here and it's an interesting thing that we can see part of the ultra orthodox uh, community that voted for the for, for the modern orthodox parties because um, they want to see the Zionist uh, struggle. Uh, it's it gets more important for them. I, I should say maybe it's a, some kind of a slow of a of a um, small community that are looking for a uh, ways to be part of the society here, society here, and instead of going to the army, unfortunately, what they find as an answer uh, is being a, a more um, seeing the nationality as their only uh, value. Thank you for that. Um... Yochanan, turning back to you, so we have some sense of what the likely government composition is going to be, Likud plus ultra-Orthodox parties plus the religious Zionists, which are complex uh, within themselves. Let's, let's discuss the um, various policy implications of this new uh, government, starting with the constitutional realm. Uh, we've heard a lot about a series of judicial reforms that are being discussed, some of them quite radical. 
Can you explain what they are, why, uh, why they're being promoted, why they've been uh, criticized, and, and why they seem to be topping the agenda right now? And all of this in three minutes. <laughs> in layman's um, terms, please. Well, Israel's democracy, and, and you know, we've discussed it in, 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 in previous you know, conversations, Israel's democracy is uniquely fragile because we do not have a constitution. So it's not some theoretical concept. We do not have a constitution. This means that a simple majority in the Knesset, 61 out of 120, can fundamentally alter and change the entire system of checks and balances, and to some extent can decide to concentrate all power, all governing power, all state power, in the hands of the political majority. And uh, uh, there are all sorts of details. There's a, a cluster of initiatives <laughs> that is now being debated during the coalition negotiations. We have to be uh, uh, fair and say there is much, I would say, a, a quote unquote fog of war. We don't exactly know. There's much uncertainty. We don't exactly know which of the initiatives that were surfaced before the election are actually going to become government part of a government legislative program. Uh, but from what uh, we're hearing and from the, some of the declarations that are coming out, um, uh, there is a, a plan to uh, put uh, to submit to the Knesset uh, uh, for approval a cluster of reforms that, in aggregate, if implemented, will uh, significantly erode the uh, uh, system of checks and balances uh, in, in Israeli state and concentrate a majority, the vast majority of the power in the hands of the political, minor, uh, political majority with uh, little constraints over the use of power. So if to be a little specific, number one, an override clause, which will mean that it, the uh, political majority will be able to override Supreme Court decisions of judicial review over Knesset legislation. So if the court decides that uh, a certain uh, a piece of legislation is not constitutional, uh, 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 politicians can override it. Uh, we have to understand some of the things that are taken for granted. The fact that Israel does not have a constitution, it also means we do not have a Bill of Rights. We do not have uh, our, our basic rights of freedom of speech and, uh, and uh, 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 ownership of property and equality before the law and the freedom of association, and all of those basic freedoms are not guaranteed. There's a basic law, which is an equivalent of a sort of constitutional chapter uh, that defines that we have, you know, a, a dignity and, um, and, 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 and liberty, but this can be changed. And the court's ability to uphold those values is, is now, uh, might be limited by an override clause by a, a cluster of initiatives that are designed to minimize, erode, water down the ability of the court to conduct judicial review over uh, administrative decisions of the executive branch, both elected officials and, uh, and public officials, uh, 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 an attempt to politicize uh, uh, the appointment of judges and to politicize the appointment of top civil servants with a focus on gatekeepers, uh, such as uh, legal advisors of ministries that are supposed not only to serve the, uh, uh, the ministers, but also to ensure the rule of law and that uh, ministers and ministries uh, are uh, uh, making uh, decisions and allocations uh, based on their uh, legal authority and so on. So if, in, uh, again, to conclude, if uh, this cluster of initiatives is passed in aggregate, it will mean that um, um, the entire uh, 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 public sphere will be controlled by one element, which is the political majority, the, the professional, the independent judiciary, the gatekeepers within the government, all of those will be uh, marginalized in the name of the genuine, uh, 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 of the, uh, in the name of the principle that uh, political majority of Half of the population plus one are entitled to do whatever they want. That might have 
uh, 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 quite dramatic implications for a whole series of uh, policy areas such as religion and state and uh, security and policy in the West Bank and and you name it. So, so I guess the the, the concern, especially to an, from an American perspective, is you know, all those checks and balances that one takes for granted in say the American system, whether it's the federal distribution of power, two houses of uh, two two houses of Congress, presidential veto, Constitution, Bill of Rights, all that does not exist in Israel. And in any case, in the parliamentary system, the government, by virtue of its, of its parliamentary majority, controls the parliament. So uh, 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 reducing the Supreme Court's power of, of judicial review is effectively removing the only real check we have on, 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 on the otherwise absolute power of a temporary political majority. The other thing you didn't mention, but you know, it seems that some of these proposals, the intent is to pass them with a simple majority, not as part of a deliberative process with a broad societal consensus, which is sort of the normal way you would think about doing sweeping constitutional reform, correct? Yeah, well, Israel is in, in, in serious uh, need for constitutional uh, reform. And, the, and, and as you mentioned, the right way of going about it is to uh, initiate a serious process and, and, and let's not be too optimistic and assume that we can now pass a fully fledged constitution, but at least some key constitutional chapters, the most important one, uh, what we call basic law for legislation, a basic, a basic law, which is our equivalent of a constitutional chapter that will create a distinction between constitutional politics and regular day to day politics, which will basically define what is the procedure for uh, legislating basic laws and will make it a more difficult procedure, say with a majority of two thirds that requires a broad consensus. Now, when we look at Israeli public opinion and uh, on, on Israelis from the right, left and center, we see that when we actually talk to them about the principles, do you want uh, that your basic freedoms will be secured and guaranteed from the intervention of the state and politicians and the political majority? Do you want your property to be protected? Do you want an independent court that will be the guardian of those rights? When you look at, you know, when you ask the specific questions, a vast majority of Israelis, again, including Israelis in the right that voted for this uh, uh, Netanyahu bloc, are interested in such a, a reform. So when you look at Israeli public opinion, the differences are not that great. But when you look now at the dynamics in the political system, there are extremely divisive dynamics. And there's a sense uh, among the parties that are going to form the coalition that if we have a, a half of the population plus one, or in this case, half of the seats in the Knesset plus four, we can fundamentally alter the arrangements that have characterized Israeli democracy for decades. And, and, and this is a, a, a dangerous, both in terms of a, a, a precedent and in terms of the actual outcomes, because you know, some, some, some of the legislations, if you go ahead with them, it will be very difficult to reverse. Right. So turning back to you, Shlomi, the, the, the calls for these sorts of judicial reforms that Yohanan talked about are coming from all coalition partners but with, with, diff, with some differences. So, and we know there are also some potentially some illegitimate personal legal considerations that are mixed in, up into this, but there also is an ideological case for, for reform. Can you give us a sense of, from the religious Zionist perspective and from the Haredi perspective, what's wrong with the status quo constitutionally and why are they promoting these sorts of reforms at the current moment? So part of the, of the discussion uh, from the ultra orthodox side, um, is about their status as a sector. Uh, how much uh, how, will they be able to keep learning in the yeshiva and still getting being able to uh, bring money home? Um, so this question, how much can they rely on the people working and, and uh, paying taxes in Israel? How much, uh, on the other side, will they need to go out and be part of the uh, workforce? And, and the military, uh, too. This is also about military service as well, right? Military service and being part of the workforce. Or um, will Israel give them those benefits and, uh, and rights without um, them being part of it, but uh, learning uh, Torah as their duty to the people? So this is a sectorial questions, and this is about benefits. 
So part of the discussion is this one. It's not necessarily ideological uh, dispute. They don't, they won't say that, um, that it's, you know, okay, but they understand that they have power now as part of the uh, government, a uh, part that uh, Netanyahu cannot uh, uh, work without. So mm -hmm. they can get more money. So for example, one of the, one of the, the things they're asking now are uh, for uh, double the money of the uh, uh, students of the Yeshivot, which gets them to get uh, their salary to be higher than um, people who are serving in the army. And this so, and presumably the court would be an obstacle to this because of concerns over equality. Yes, equality, and uh, and also you know you uh, people should get uh, rights and duties. Now, where do you how do you balance it? If you're being too uh, greedy, the court might stop it, and also the reality might stop it because. Uh, uh, the people uh, which are not old Orthodox might say, enough, I'm not uh, willing to, to make this uh, effort anymore. So this is the, the, the benefits of the sector is part of it. But the other factor, uh, the, the other uh, side is about the public sphere. What would be the identity of the public sphere? Will there be separation, for example, between men and women in a, a public transportation in specific uh, neighborhoods that are only with ultra orthodox uh, uh, yeah. what will happen with cultural events will there be separation what's going to happen in the universities the colleges and, and, and so on so those are the uh, question that the court decided on uh, uh, many times uh, the court also helped the ultra orthodox they are a minority in israel so sometimes the court standard uh, stood uh, in the side of the minorities and sometimes the court said bill of rights uh, in, even though as yochanan said we don't have it as a constitution the values were given and uh, 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 protected by the court another example is about conversions there is a big uh, um, dispute here in Israel uh, about, we, we should remember we have here the law of return, um, someone who is a, a, a child or a grandchild of a Jew uh, from everywhere can come and immediately get all the rights of a citizen here. Uh, and of course, a, a financial benefits as well. So the question is, um, this is one of the questions, by the way, now about the law of return. The, the new government would like to stop the grandchildren of Jews to be able to get those benefits. But also when we're talking about conversion, can someone convert to Judaism not by the rabbinical? Here is, there's no separation between a state and religion. A, we are, our, the law is according to our personal status um, as Jews or as Muslims or uh, the specific uh, church of, uh, of Christian people. So someone who is not a Jew by the eyes of the Rabbanut uh, cannot, the Rabbinet, cannot, uh, uh, be, uh, cannot get married, for example, in Israel uh, uh, to, uh, to another Jew. So what's happening about uh, with uh, conversions that are done by the reform uh, or the conservative movements? So during the 80s, there was the big dispute about this, about people getting converted, uh, for example, in the United States, and then coming here as Jews, will they be uh, seen as Jews here by the law of return, by the financial benefits, and by the rabbinet? And, uh, and the court was the one who said, yes, people who are coming here as Jews after being converted by the reform movement, for example, would be seen as Jews in the eyes of the uh, most of the ministers, except the rabbinet, they will be about uh, the law. Uh, will see them as Jews here. They will be written as Jews. The nationality in their uh, certificate would be a Jew. But the rabbinet will see will still uh, work uh, only with Orthodox. And then during the night nineties. Uh, this was asked about conversions happening here in Israel, and mostly in the last uh, uh, a few years. And then also the court said, if you are being converted by 
uh, the reform movement here in Israel, you will also be seen uh, as a Jew in the eyes of most of the institutions. And just recently, uh, also, there are private conversions here in Israel, even Orthodox ones and not Orthodox ones. And the court said every uh, community, which is a recognized community is by the eyes of the members of the community, will be seen as a Jewish community, also by the eyes of, uh, of the court and therefore by the law. So now what's going to happen? If, if uh, th those parties will say, uh, we want to override the court, they can make a new law that says, okay, what the court said doesn't stand anymore. And the court, if we will have this override clause, will not be able to turn things back. So this is about protecting different minorities, the ultra-Orthodox included, but if they have all these uh, numbers uh, in the parliament, they don't need the court anymore. Yeah, it's interesting. You're, you're, it's an important reminder that Israel really is, uh, as, as former President Rivlin famously said, uh, uh, made up of, of tribes. And in a way, we are all minorities inside the Jewish state. And in the absence of a constitution and a bill of rights, the point that we at IDI make often, the Supreme Court is really the only organization, imperfect though it may be, and maybe it, it, it needs its own reform, but that, that stands up for the, for the rights of minorities. So this may be also a double-edged sword. You be careful what you wish for. You take away that power and then whether it's the ultra orthodox or the seculars or the settlers, or whoever, uh, we're all minorities could, could suffer the consequences of removing that. Last Things tend echo. to backfire. Yeah, but Johan, uh, turning back to you, I mean, what what Shlomit is describing, and these are, for the most part, internal issues. What is the public sphere going to look like, and uh, subsidies, and whether Israeli taxpayers are willing to continue footing the bill for a growing number of yeshiva students, and and the whole question of military service. But these issues of religion and state really are a throwback to the controversies of who's a Jew in the, in the 1980s and things that really concern the other half of the Jewish people in the diaspora. How concerned are you about a, a crisis between Israel and the diaspora over some of these issues if they do come to pass? Uh, well, the bottom line is that I am concerned. Again, I want to uh, qualify uh, these statements because we're still in the, some kind of a, a situation of uncertainty. But, in, but from what we hear, and, 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 and one of the features of the new coalition is that uh, there's the ultra-Orthodox parties that are returning to power with extra appetite after being out of power for about a, a year. Ex, extra appetite and an extra sense of, uh, of strength. Politically, Mr. Netanyahu is 100% dependent on them because he has no options in the center left, especially no options as long as he wants to uh, initiate various uh, changes to uh, weaken or confront the uh, judiciary and law enforcement institutions, given the fact that he uh, has his own uh, uh, interests uh, as an indicted, uh, as, a, as, a, as a politician, but also a citizen that is dealing with an indictment in court. So Netanyahu then is fully dependent on the ultra-Orthodox parties, they're returning with uh, hunger and appetite. Uh, and, and, and we see it in the kind of demands for dozens of billions of shekels for the education system, for subsidies, for housing, uh, and no incentives for going to work and, and so on. So to some extent, again, if implemented, this cluster of initiatives will uh, really take us uh, backwards in terms of uh, some of the processes of integration of the ultra Orthodox. Now, the two other parties, uh, this combination of the uh, Jewish power party, which is a, an offshoot of, uh, of, of the Kach, Meir Kahana's uh, uh, Kach uh, uh, party, and, uh, and the Smotrich party that is, uh, again, uh, 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 what we call in Hebrew, Chardali, uh, sort of a very, uh, uh, very uh, Orthodox, uh, 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 very strongly Orthodox, to some extent even ultra-Orthodox in the religious faith, uh, far-right parties. So those two uh, far-right and, and nationalistic parties, um, what characterizes them is that they're led by two relatively young politicians who are very, who are staunch ideologues. Now, I think this is to some extent a, a source of strength, but also a source of weakness of the new coalition. 
source of strength because they, we also saw it during the coalition negotiation. They mean what they say, and therefore some of the um, threats uh, or fundamental changes that Shlomit and I mentioned are you know, likely to, to happen. Because again, Netanyahu depends on them just as much as he depends on the ultra-Orthodox, and he's willing to go very far. It's mm -hmm. not the same Netanyahu that we knew 10 or 20 years ago. Um, on the other hand, because they're not pragmatic politicians, because they're relatively new, uh, uh, the, I don't I don't necessarily see them sort of stopping at a red light of you know driving a wedge between you know say us and American jury, us in a U.S. administration on on questions of say uh, settlements, West Bank, uh, status quo in Temple Mount. Uh, Netanyahu is very pragmatic, and he. He can easily say something in an election campaign and two weeks later uh, do something else. Uh, you know, he's been around the block. But mm -hmm. the ultra, but the, the those two far right uh, politicians are still uh, uh, trying to sort of, you see them still in election mode, uh, very excited about the uh, the fact that 11% of Israelis has supported them and, uh, and they want to preserve this level of support. Mm -hmm. So it will either, either cause a headache for Mr. Netanyahu or it will cause a headache for the national interest. Yeah, so um, we're going to open it up to questions in, in, in a minute or so, but I just, to, we talked about this external dimension in terms of a, a potential rift with the um, um, uh, jury overseas. Talking about defense and foreign policy more generally, how do you see policy changing under a Netanyahu government? And now bearing in mind as, we, as this conversation has emphasized that it's, it's a government led by Netanyahu with all the pragmatism and caution and, and, and what we've come to know of him as a leader. But A, there's a question about whether he has changed, whether he sees things differently, and, and, and B, how, to what extent he can control some of these ideologues, some might even say firebrands that are likely to hold significant positions in um, some with the national security um, uh, responsibilities in this new government. Well, when it comes to national security, I don't think there's a different uh, Netanyahu. Um, he's very experienced. We've, he's been around the block. Uh, you know, as he became prime minister for the first time in '96. Then he was in central roles in governments, and then prime minister again from 2009 until 2021. So he's he has no interest in uh, in deviating from uh, past policies that uh, were characterized by. Uh, uh, status quo in terms of uh, West Bank and so on, caution. He uh, uh, didn't seek uh, religious, uh, sorry, uh, military adventures. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, and since he's very focused also on the Iranian issue, he would want to sort of uh, uh, clear the front and not look for any kind of escalation, neither in Gaza uh, nor in the West Bank, where he's experienced enough to know that uh, at the end of every, every escalation, you return back to square one. So, and, and, and we also know that Netanyahu has uh, insisted on appointing a defense minister, uh, probably uh, uh, Yoav Gallant, uh, who's an experienced uh, uh, general who, uh, who uh, does not have any kind of uh, reputation for recklessness. So this is the uh, side that, you know, while, while we expect Netanyahu's new government on the constitutional areas to be, to be a revisionist or to seek changes in the area of religion and state, we also expect some dramatic changes in the areas of integration of the ultra-Orthodox and so on. On security, we do not expect them. However, the caveat to that, we mentioned before uh, Smotrich and Ben Gvir having a lot of power in this new government. Ben Gvir, the Kahana disciple, uh, uh, being in charge of the uh, of the uh, uh, homeland security ministry, plus additional authorities. He's even requesting authority over uh, the border police, which is a, a, a big chunk of the uh, soldiers in the West Bank are called border police. They are operated by the military, but uh, formally uh, belong to the police in terms of police training and so on. He wants to control them. Uh, Smotrich, the other uh, far right uh, uh, sort of radical politician who's going to be finance minister, wants to be, uh, control the civil administration uh, in the West Bank. So some, and, and Ben Gvir himself, not only does, want, does he want to control the border police, but he also 
states that he plans to uh, go to Temple Mount. Uh, now, just any one of those uh, initiatives, even if partially they're implemented, or even if none of them are implemented, but those individuals use their power in order to uh, deliver on some of their provocative policies and so on, even if Mr. Netanyahu does not want things to go out of hand, they can, uh, they, they, we can easily lose control. And let's not forget that the situation now on the, on the ground is extremely tense. We have we had the year with the highest level of, 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 uh, of terror attacks. The, uh, uh, the West Bank mainly is, uh, is, uh, is very, um, um, uh, there's a very noisy and dangerous situation. Many uh, terror initiatives that some were thwarted and some uh, took place and so on. So if you add that situation in the field with potential provocations, either of Ben Gvir or of Smotrich or Ben Gvir going on Temple Mount, although Netanyahu doesn't want it, I, I, I wouldn't be able to rule out neither, nor, neither escalation nor deterioration with the relationship uh, with the U.S. administration as a result of Smotrich uh, uh, changing the status quo with respect to settlement policy. All right, so I, I want to encourage our participants to um, submit questions via the chat or the Q&A. Um, Alana, <laughs> if you have uh, questions that have accumulated on your end by other channels, so we, we can uh, open it up at this stage. Okay, great. So I will get us started with a few questions that we've gotten so far. Um, and thank you so much to our speakers and panelists. This has been a really fascinating conversation. Um, so let's see. So the first question we have here, um, the last coalition included an Arab party for the first time. Did this experiment really fail? And what are the implications for this community from this election? Well, indeed, there was an, uh, a sort of a, a first time in the previous coalition, an experiment, an Arab party in the coalition. Uh, uh, in the, in the eyes of the public, it failed because uh, the Arab uh, minority didn't feel like it got uh, the, it delivered the goods yet that we see it in, in our public opinion figures. Uh, and, uh, and, in the, uh, and among the Jewish majority, it was too difficult to digest this idea, especially in a year that it, 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 it that had so many uh, terror attacks and, and challenges to personal security also on the uh, 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 homeland front, i.e. crime and so on. So the combination of crime, unfortunately, mainly perpetrated by Arab perpetrators, you know, Bedouins in the south and in Israel's peripheries, demands for protection and so on, and terror attacks uh, validated for many Israelis the fear that if there's an Islamic party in the government, it means that uh, the government cannot properly and appropriately deal with their, of course, if I can say, you know, with respect, it's nonsense. Uh, 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 you know, the security establishment is the same and it got instructions to deal with the terror. Uh, uh, but in the eyes of many in the public, they made this connection. And since there was such opposition to the Ram Arab party, the coalition from other Arab politicians, they effectively managed to delegitimize Ram's role in the coalition. Uh, and, uh, and, and although the government did pass some unprecedented decisions of allocations of, say, uh, on a multi-year plan of 30 billion shekels for economic and social development in the Arab sector, the money still didn't trickle down. It's, it remained government decisions. We were involved in some of them in helping shaping some of the policy aspects and policy uh, concrete uh, uh, details uh, you know for gap year program and others but 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 uh, you know those those it remains still uh, on the uh, on the uh, um, on the boards of the bureaucrats but it not fell down in the street and therefore uh, to some extent if we look in the short term it failed but on the other hand i think mansour abbas in the islamic party uh, understood that, it, that uh, this is the way to go. They nevertheless got five seats. So a big chunk, half of the uh, or uh, Arab representation in the Knesset today are people who voted for a party that is adamant to continue. And, uh, and I don't think the, the, the Israeli center left has any kind of uh, political future if they won't include elements like Mansour Abbas in their coalition. So in the <laughs> short term, it, it failed. 
in the longer term, uh, uh, we shall see. And just there's another uh, perspective on that. I mean, if we look at the results of the election, um, the Arab, because Balad failed to pass the threshold and only two parties made it into Knesset, combined representation, I mean, strictly formally by parties that, that speak on behalf of the Arab minority, they all, Arab voters do vote in some, to some degree for, 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 for non-Arab parties, for Zionist parties, but it's 10 seats in the Knesset out of 120. If the, the, the Arab minority is about 20% of the population, if they voted according to their percentage in their population at rates similar to the Jewish majority, they would have 24 seats in the Knesset, not 10. No, the, uh, it doesn't exactly work in this way. Uh, n- number one, because it's true that we have the Arab uh, representation is about, tw- the, the Arab minority is around 20%. You don't really include the Druze uh, population there because they vote for Zionist parties and so on. And out of the, say, remaining 19%, about uh, uh, 3%, give or take, are uh, from East Jerusalem that are residents, but not citizens that vote, uh, permanent residents, but not citizens that vote in elections. So we're down to 16, and it's a relatively young population. So in terms of uh, percentage of the uh, eligible voters, it's uh, less than the 16%. uh, uh, But it's interesting if you compare it to the uh, ultra-Orthodox that are 13% of the population but much less, because their population is very young, much less uh, in the electorate. But nevertheless, because they vote in such high numbers, they have 18 seats. So 18 of for 13% of the population with far more kids versus uh, 10 for a population, say, of 16% or 17 uh, I would like to add something that even though it is a failure, as Yochanan said, in the eyes of the people, there is something to be said about uh, seeing a reality that uh, we couldn't think of actually happening in front of our eyes. So when, when people in Israel see a Arab party sitting in the government, being part of, of the decisions, seeing their leaders stands and says he recognizes the Jewish a, a state of Israel. And condemns terror attacks. And condemns terror. So this is something that we get used to see. So the option for this to be part of our life in future time gets easier. So maybe it's not a, a, a big, a, you know, a, it's not, it doesn't make it a, a big success, but still something in the minds of the people did change. Right, and we also remember that, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu, when he was still trying to form a coalition in, in various rounds, was also negotiating with Mansour Abbas, and that also helped to legitimize, at least for the moment, the possibility of Jewish-Arab partnership in government, and uh, who knows what the future holds in that regard. Thank you. Um, let's see, we have another question that just came through. Um, how long do you expect this coalition to last, uh, given that uh, Lapid said he'll be back quicker than we expect, but the coalition is looking solid, um, as we discussed? Well, uh, you know, we say in Hebrew, it's like the predict prophecy was granted to... Uh, I wouldn't even know how to translate. Not <laughs> the smart one. <laughs> but uh, so you can't really make predictions. But it looks like a rally. Uh, on the one hand, it's a it's a sound majority, right? Sixty four versus fifty six, and the fifty six are not really cohesive. So uh, it's not a fragile coalition. It can only if it if it falls apart. It's only because uh, the coalition, uh, you know, one of the factions, uh, if they don't get along now. Uh, I would expect both Smotrich and Ben Gvir, they're the two suspects for not getting along with Netanyahu, because the ultra-Orthodox and Netanyahu have a history of decades of getting along. So if it's only up to Netanyahu and the ultra-Orthodox, we, we, it would be safe to predict a four-year coalition. Smotrich and Ben Gvir, each of them is, is uh, as I mentioned, the hard-right nationalist, and some of them, some would even say racist ideologues. And... Uh, uh, they will insist on uh, implementing parts of their agenda, which is extremely unpopular among mainstream Israelis, also among Likud voters. So if they actually insist on in implementing their agenda, it might uh, uh, cause some uh, trouble in public opinion. At some point, the more we move to the next election, uh, 
uh, they will want to uh, deliver to their constituency, and Netanyahu and members of the Likud will, will think about the broader public and so on. So, so if I uh, sort of balance all of those uh, uh, vectors, I would say two and a half to three and a half uh, years. That would be my prediction. Okay, great. Um, we just have another question that came through. Um, so the left wing imploded for a few reasons, one of which is due to the various parties not coming together to form joint lists like the right wing did. So has there been any recriminations on the part of the left who failed so miserably? Any accountability? Well, look, the, the Zionist left in Israel does not, especially in an, in an era of a threshold for entering the Knesset uh, of a three and a three percent and a quarter, uh, there's no room for two left-wing Zionist uh, uh, parties. It was clear both the uh, labor and merits, there isn't enough uh, breeding ground. Uh, since the second intifada, a systemic shift took place in Israeli politics, and a big chunk of Israelis that formerly defined themselves as, in the, as, as part of the left or moderate left in, in the 80s and 90s shifted to the center. So today, roughly speaking, about 25 to 30 percent of Israelis define themselves as centrist. And, and in the left, somewhere between 12 and 15, 17 percent, again, depending on who asks what's the day and so on, uh, what's the weather. So, uh, and not all of those who define themselves as left actually vote for a left-wing party. So yeah, there's room uh, uh, for one left-wing Zionist party. Labor and Meretz should have uh, 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 run together, should have formed a, you know, uh, uh, one uh, um, a faction, even if they could have had the sort of two separate divisions within that faction to allow for different uh, sort of uh, voices uh, in, in streams of thinking within it. So, and, and now obviously there's no other choice because labor is only four seats, merits vanished and, and they, they're in major debt. So they won't be able to continue to operate uh, uh, as, a, uh, as a political uh, movement, but the people are there, the ideas are there, there is an electorate. The, there, there's not going to be in the foreseeable future, a left-wing party as a ruling party, but for sure, there's room for a significant uh, left-wing party that uh, will uh, represent those views uh, in Israeli public life and parliamentary life. Okay, thinking a little bit about foreign policy, we have a question here. Um, are there concerns in Israel as to how the Biden administration or other Western allies might react to some of the changes that you've described? Well, generally, I would say uh, Israelis are not really concerned because, you know, we've been, we became numb to some extent. We've been sort of uh, uh, been warned of, you know, problems uh, with allies and so on. I remember uh, Ehud Barak, as defense minister under Netanyahu about 10 or 12 years ago, warning of our diplomatic tsunami if we do not uh, uh, move forward with the Palestinians. And, uh, and, and then on the other hand, you know, the, the, there's no real option for making any significant progress. Even if there was an, a, a, an absolutely di a different government in Israel, Abu Mazen is now aged 87. He is not willing, not able, not ready uh, to make any kind of uh, movements. We still don't know uh, uh, how the Palestinians will organize themselves. Hamas is obviously not a partner for any big diplomatic maneuvers. So, so on this front, there's no, there are no real options. And uh, so as long as, uh, as the Israeli new government de facto will not deviate from past understandings in the status quo, say uh, uh, in Temple Mount, in terms of Temple Mount, settlements, uh, uh, security adventures, as long as it will sort of uh, 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 continue the line of past policies, I don't see a reason for any kind of a major rift. And of course, <laughs> with the Biden administration, there are many areas of mutual interests and, uh, and, and understandings be dealing with the uh, Iranian uh, vector and threat and, uh, and, and, and strengthening the access with the other Sunni moderate states and dealing with the Hezbollah threat and so on. So we have many shared uh, 
uh, interests. So uh, again, as long as Israeli policy doesn't dramatically deviate from uh, past traditions, I don't see a reason for any uh, rift. This is about the administration, but maybe we do have a rift to be concerned about with the Jewish people of uh, the United States, um, the, the jury that we, we need to be able to speak in a similar language, to see our Judaism as something that is a, a, in a way being interrupted, of course, in many ways, but a, a, the heart of it being similar to, to all of us. And this, this might be a problem uh, between the, the, the way the Judaism is being understood by the administration of, of the, the state of Israel and by uh, Jews around the world. And maybe here there is also a, a duty for, for other Jews outside of Israel to pick up their voice. Um, so I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, we have one here about cost of living. Um, so the cost of living was a major issue in the election. Will the government succeed to bring the cost of living down and will there be any political repercussions if they fail? Well, uh, it, it wasn't really, uh, it, it was an issue when you asked Israelis, what are the issues that you care about? They said cost of living. But in terms of voting patterns, it had close to zero influence. Perhaps it moved some votes from, say, Likud to Shas party that ran an effective campaign promising various vouchers and so on, food vouchers. But uh, so Israelis care about the cost of living, but it's not a political issue. And you don't even, and, and, it's, uh, and frankly, it would be difficult to, uh, 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 to point out any major differences, we still don't know what will be the new econ the economic policy of the new government, but it's not like there's a clear set of ideas that this new government will adopt that is very different from the previous government. The main issue when you talk about cost of living is cost of housing. This is a structural problem of supply that has been characterizing Israeli economy over the past decade, and mul multiple governments were not able to properly uh, deal with it. Uh, on other aspects, the truth is, and perhaps not very popular among you know, Israeli uh, you know, societies, that uh, inflation here was about half than in the other advanced economies. Uh, uh, real wages grew more in the past decade than other uh, economies. And what mainly explains the relative rise in cost of living is the strengthening of the shekel. So when you look at Israeli economy today and, and versus a, a decade ago, except for the question of housing, it, the the uh, uh, real prices are not uh, 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 higher, especially if you compare it to other uh, uh, to to the purchasing power in other advanced uh, economies. It's true that there's a fundamental structural problem of productivity that is translated to relatively low wages in Israel. So it's not an issue of the past year; it's an issue of the past decades. And here, I don't expect this government, given its makeup and the strong ultra-Orthodox influence, I don't expect this government to initiate any fundamental structural reforms that will put us on a trajectory of, uh, of growth in productivity and, 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 and narrowing the gaps between uh, Israelis. In a way, on the other hand, we are talking about the ultra-Orthodox society, which uh, socio-economical <laughs> are very poor, very low. And this is a um, also, this is something that is uh, uh, going together with the Arab community. So since the ultra-Orthodox have so much power in the government, their decision in order to give their people um, freely more benefits um, and uh, make the food uh, uh, cost less and uh, uh, the fuel and things like this, so I think maybe we have the other way around because the concern would be to the question how much a specific family with many kids, sometimes 10 and 12 kids, would have to pay when they have only one a person in the family working. So this is the question which will be a very important to the legislators and we might see a, uh, the the government trying to answer this questions this question with a different solution which uh, may not bring to growth
Thank you. Um, so I know there's so much more we could discuss, but we are at time, so we're going to have to close things down. Um, I just want to say thank you so much to all of our panelists um, and thank you to the Israel Democracy Institute for being such a great partner and helping us facilitate these important conversations. Um, I know I've been following the news very closely and that uh, you know, this has been very enlightening for me. I hope it has been for everyone. And I'm sure we're all going to be on the edge of our seats, you know, for the next few days and weeks to see how everything unfolds. So thank you so much. And thank you for everyone who joined us today. Thank, thank you. you. Goodbye from Jerusalem. Thank you.